Welcome to our webinar about building your own trading optimization analysis using our point in time API, using point in time market data from the OneTick cloud. So today we have two speakers from OneTick. We have Louis, who is Director of Solutions. Louis' responsible, responsibilities include delivering targeted solutions for quantitative research and trading systems. Louis brings over 20 years of experience in developing cutting edge solutions for financial markets. Prior to joining One Market Data, Louis was the chief architect of a Palmer, an event processing product line from Progress Software. Jeff Banker is SVP of Market Development. Jeff joined One Market Data in 2013 and is focused on expanding the firm's capabilities and assets. Jeff previously served as executive vice president of Interactive Data's Real Time Market Data and Trading Solution Group, where he was responsible for a $300 million PL providing content analytics and managed infrastructure to the trading and wealth management segments. The agenda for today, Jeff's going to provide you an overview of One Market Data and go into some of the product capabilities the organization gives to customers, look at some of the current data, data management challenges, and also look in a bit more detail at the point in time product strategy. Louis will then take us into some of the features and benefits and use cases of the point in time API, and also then provide a demonstration after which we'll have some questions and answers. So before we get started, and as additional people join the event, let's run a couple of quick polls here, asking how you know about OneTick and what's your relationship. So what's your relationship with OneTick? Are you a past customer, existing customer, currently evaluating, interested with a project, or perhaps just looking around and you're a student? Thank you all, all for participating. So most people here are either currently evaluating or an existing customer. The next poll, just so that Jeff and Louis have a good sense of who's in the event today, what type of firm are you Are you in? Market center, exchange, bank, asset management, hedge fund, market maker, broker. Excellent, thank you so much. So most people here are in asset management or a hedge fund with some people in market centers and a couple of broker dealers in there as well. Jeff, I turn this over to you now. Thank you, Justin, good morning. As a follow-up to our last webinar, uh, we certainly continue to see an acceleration of capital market applications moving to the cloud, including real-time data capture, analytics, trade surveillance, and trading applications, which include proprietary data. While such transitions have not been without challenges, the driving goal is to increase scalability and reduce operational costs and maintenance without sacrificing performance. These goals have mostly been met, but with, with it comes a need for continuous tuning and optimization where applications rely on hundreds of terabytes of high density time series data. Capabilities include tick data capture analytics, transaction cost analysis, trade surveillance and regulatory solutions, and our managed data service, which we'll focus on today. While we have prepackaged offerings, our competitive differentiator by way of our OneTick software is the ability to customize our analytics and dashboard to meet client requirements where applications leverage our managed data services. And this slide just shows a subset of the dashboards we've created for different use cases that rely on our managed data service and our one tick platform hosted in AWS. So what are the best practices for delivering TCK, TCA capabilities? First, we must start with platform scalability. As illustrated in this recent chart below, which plots daily size of all trades and quotes captured from the US TAC uh, database since January, 2023, on March 13th, during the SVB banking crisis, the data density and size of the daily file for U.S. equities increased by nearly 250% from prior days, requiring one and a half terabytes of storage to capture the following month of trading activity for just one market and expected 12 to 14 terabytes for all of 2023 for just one market. After scalability, data alignment is the next most relevant area of focus. Raw source data from exchanges is readily available, as we all know here, from multiple providers. However, if you're trading globally, there is a significant number of alignment tasks necessary to enable the data for high performance retrieval and accuracy. Retrieving a single data point, a trade at a given nanosecond interval, requires optimization and alignment when several hundred thousand or million symbol timestamp combinations are considered. And there's really three topics of, to discuss around data alignment. The first is reference data mapping from venue symbols to entity such as exchange symbols, Bloomberg tickers to QSIP, ISIN, or CEDL. The second is timestamp alignment. We know that timestamps come in all different granularities from nanos to mills, and choosing to publish their exchange matching timestamp is often related to the source quality of the, uh, the timestamp itself. And the third is the application of trade condition filters, where you filter out auction trades, algo trades, post off book reporting, currencies, and dark versus lit volume, so we ensure that the data you're getting 
through the application for supporting your TCA is aligned with the type of trades that you want to consider for your benchmarking. When data is aligned, TCA analytics are less complex to implement. The results of these alignment tasks are illustrated in this Vodafone trade sample using our European composite database, which shows the timestamp alignment, venue aggregation, and normalized trade conditions to enable easy filtering. Our EU composite database aggregates 33 plus venues for which about 3,000 licenses trade across multiple venues. Providing an aggregate database allows TCA applications to simply query with a timestamp to return all the relevant trades and data from across all applicable venues. All these best practices and issues have been considered and addressed in our one to cloud platform, which is focused on solving the following four things. First, data aggregation of hundreds of exchange sources and reference data. Second, platform scalability, platform scalability to handle millions of analytical calculations. Third, high performance analytics to minimize compute expense and retrieval time. And finally, a usage-based fee model to offer flexible commercial alternatives. With these objectives in mind, I'd like now to turn it over to Louis Lobus, who will demonstrate these capabilities. Louis? Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to share my screen. Pick up where Jeff left off. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to sort of target or talk mostly about this point in time API in where it, it fits, what its purpose is, um, but in how it fits as part of our overall service offering for analytics and uh, cloud data. And Jeff talked about a number of these things in terms of what does it mean to query data from our, our, uh, our cloud inventory, which is a hosted service that um, any of our customers, data customers, or actually technology customers as well, can have access to. Um, and primarily this idea of sort of specialized uh, data sets through customized queries as this point in time is, and I'll describe that. And then the other part of this is about data delivery. How do you actually get this? If you're gonna use the specialized interface, how do you uh, consume that data? How do you ingest that data? And there's two basic models for that. One is on demand. And that's through what we call a, a RESTful web API interface, which implies all you need on your side is the ability to issue an HTTP request a bit more, that's basic authentication based. Um, and uh, I don't know a single programming language that doesn't support uh, basic authentication HTTPS access. Uh, we do provide a Python library to make that a little bit easier for Python users. That's probably the most prevalent um, language we see our customers using. We also provide uh, this point in time through batch. So rather than it being an on-demand request response, you simply upload um, an input file that defines these symbol uh, date combos. And I'll show some examples of that. And we have a process that kicks off that will produce the results and you simply download those results. Um, and some examples, just the, the general case for our one tick cloud, you can get just simply raw trades and quotes. You can get daily data and the futures market, you can get settlement data and open interest. We also produce uh, one minute trade bars and quote bars. Um, and then lastly is this point in time interface. <clears throat> so what is this thing? It is a custom query designed for uh, basic trade analytics. So the fact that um, any of you, all of you that are on this webinar are interested in this point in time would imply that you have some responsibility within your firm for understanding the pre-trade or post-trade uh, analysis. So you can get a sense of that. Um, and this, the design of this is kind of like what this best fit says, that your responsibility is to build those TCA metrics, whether it's about slippage, uh, market impact, or any sort of trade, post-trade or pre-trade analytics. Um, the other two most notable are you trade globally. So you're not just trading, for example, in the US equity or the LSC, the London Stock Exchange, but you might trade in Southeast Asia, Canada, South America, um, whether it's your own proprietary trading for your firm or your you're uh, handling client order flow and you're building up essentially TCA type applications for your client base. That's where this thing, this web um, based point in time API actually really shines. 
And of course, if you trade multi-asset, because it's also supports not just equities, but futures and FX as well. And why a specialized data API? Um, it's just a single interface. It's a single query API for all markets globally. Again, all markets, all equity markets, whether you're in the US, whether in Europe, any place in Europe, in London, in Helsinki or Singapore or Malaysia or Tokyo, it's a single API. And the, <clears throat> and the logic behind this API understands the nuances of each and every market. And those nuances, as Jeff pointed out, are things related to timestamps, time zones, um, symbologies, um, whether it's tickers or Bloomberg tickers or Isons or CEDLs or QCIPs. Um, uh, trade filtering when the market is in continuous trading as opposed to an auction mode when it opens when it closes those are all sort of idiosyncrasy idiosyncrasies unique to each and every market globally um so what do you get a single api across all of those you get a normalized result set um coming back um, again, if you're here, you're interested in a point in time, point in time customized specialized data API for pre-trade and post-trade. And here's just a few examples. Again, any sort of um, trade optimization by virtue of understanding slippage, impact analysis, liquidity analysis, um, and any measure of that trade because yeah, it is basically benchmarks. This API is about pro <clears throat> providing you benchmarks um, so that you compare the market to your, your own trade activity. Um, and what do you get? Um, here's just sort of brief summary. Um, the pit point in time, as the name implies, it's a single point in time. So you give um, the input, it's, it's a symbol and a date time and you get back, what does the market look like leading up to that time? So it's really up to you to define uh, what that time represents, whether it's an order arrival, or it's, it's an execution, or maybe a series of timestamps from an execution forward or backward, thus the idea of doing your own sort of market impact analysis. That's really for you to define and decide. So it's, it's a completely opaque, um, you're not divulging any sort of trade activity to us on this API whatsoever. It's, <clears throat> and on the interval side, it's really about uh, duration benchmarks. Sort of the classic thing is an order arrival to its completion. And then therein lies what are the benchmarks for that interval duration. And so the easiest way to show that is by example. Um, and just to make it simple to visualize, I'm just gonna show what some of this looks like in Excel. And then I'll jump over and show the API, which is simply a run function where you're actually running a query on our hosted instance. And then you get back results of that, which you can then either write to a file or you can just simply in the Python world, you can put it in a data frame and then just see the results of that. Um, but from <clears throat> what it means from the input side, you look at this file here almost on a row by row basis. I'll just pick a random one, right? So you would either through that on-demand API or through the batch service, you would create a file like this, a CSV file, where you've got sort of these fields defined as security, its symbology, the market, right? The market by its uh, um, market identification code or MIC, an asset type, whether it's an equity or derivative. Uh, let me jump over that for a moment. The currency, the currency could either be uh, two types. It could be a filter. So any market that may trade in multiple currencies like the London Stock Exchange currency can be a filter um, or it could be a target, right? So for markets that trade in multiple currencies, the target here is says, um, for any and all trades, I want to see the results in this currency. And the logic behind point in time will do a rate conversion or a unit conversion to that target currency. Um, COAC stands for corporate action date, which is primarily applicable to the equities market. 
So this is indicating that for this date, that symbol is actively traded as opposed to a symbol that may have gone through a name change or been delisted in any way. And of course, lastly, is the timestamp itself. So this timestamp represents the logic that says from this timestamp, I'm gonna look backwards to the, what is the nearest quote and the nearest trade without going past that date, up to and including that date, of course. A uh, query ID is simply something that um, is user defined. You can define any value you want here in the result or that query ID is simply echoed back. And I've seen customers just use this as almost like an index so they can sort of see the input to the output pretty simply in that way. Um, again, you look at this on a row by row basis. So in this case, there's uh, 32 or 31 inputs. So you're gonna get back uh, a one for one mapping. Each, each input symbol date combo is gonna return a single row with that result. And that result looks like this. Um, again, I put this in Excel so it's easier to visualize, but the results are CSV, compressed CSV, uh, comma separated values file. So again, things that are echoed back are the secure day ID and that symbol and the original request date. And then um, this quote time says, for this particular time, the nearest quote in this example, right? It was the previous day, the previous day close. Um, and there it is, right? So there's the quote from the nearest quote from the original request time. And then there's the trade and the nearest trade um, from the original request time. And there's that query ID echo back. Uh, this field right here called is mapped. Uh, just from my own experience and working with uh, customers with this point in time, probably the biggest area that causes um, uh, discussion, if you will, is the symbology. The symbol was that symbol active on the request date. So what this is mapped means is I can take that symbol, in this case, that very first one is a QSIP, and it's recognizable, it is a mapped symbol on that date. So this tells me, and I'm reporting it back on the results, that that's a valid symbol for the requested date. Um, if in fact it said false, that means that the logic in, within our data uh, inventory and our reference data inventory, it's not a recognized symbol. Um, and then what's put on the end here, you can see these additional fields. That is the quote. Um, in what we call a forward markout. So from that original uh, quote request time, I go ahead a quarter second, a half a second on the bid and the ask and say, just a peek ahead from your request in the quote time, what is the next one? Just a short distance in the, in the future. Um, so that's what the point in time looks like. Again, you would send an, an input file and this can be a <clears throat> hundred thousand rows. It isn't limited to my little simple example of 30 here. It could easily be 100,000. Or um, if you want to do like a million a day, you have a huge client base, then you would typically send multiple files. Um, the other interface with this point in time is called interval, which is exactly the same as the point in time, except now you're providing two uh, timestamps, two date times. One is the start, one is the end. Um, and so what you get back is a completely different result set because you get intervalized results, sort of classic interval benchmarks, right? With, for example, a VWAP, TWAP, time rated average, and then a bar, open, high, low, close. Um, you know, what is the trade volume in that? How many trades actually occurred? What is the volatility of the trading this, on the spread side? I'm sorry, the quote side is just the average spread. Um, so that's the result you get back. These are classic benchmarks for a order where you see an order trading a large block order, you have an arrival and a completion. Whatever the algo is that might be trading that, you can then say, okay, how well did I fill my order um, on your side? And you can compare it to the market benchmarks on that interval. Um, these two additional fields on here are called limit price and limit side. 
um, allow you to uh, sort of adjust or tweak the, what the interval logic is actually doing. This is a limit adjusted interval. So what it does is you're telling me on this example right here that um, I only want to see an interval um, up to this limit price, right? So what it does is remove any non-marketable non -marketable, uh, trades uh, within that interval because you wouldn't have traded them anyway. So you can just compare your uh, limit price to what the market looks like, the interval, the benchmarks of that interval, just within the, the marketable price that you, you put in on your order. Uh, and of course, that means you have to do that on the buy and sell side as well. But that's optional for you to do as opposed to the, just what does the market look like gen generically. Um, as I said, this is what the results look like with the interval. Um, and if you notice here, these you know, just as by way of an example, these markets are just all over the place. Um, you can see just by the time zone, they're all over the world. But if I go back here, you you can see that just from the currency, you know, Malaysia, US, Europe, um, it's just all over. So this, again, this is a single query API that covers all these markets, roughly a hundred markets world over. Um, between equity and derivatives, and the derivatives are futures and options um, for that. Um, this last one here, essentially, we do also provide, you know, daily data. So if you're interested, essentially looking at daily prices, you can easily get that from us as well. And, uh, oh, and like I said, here's, you know, a simple example using point in time through an on-demand web API request and we've created this package Python uh, library module called OneTick.Query. Uh, so OTC stands for OneTick uh, Cloud, a run function. And that, that is actually simply gonna translate into an HTTP request directed at that specific URL. And then you're passing your input list to that. That's an example of the point in time right there. And the other one is interval right there. Um, and that's, that's kind of like a simple example of how this works. And I think, yep, I did the demo. So it's back to you, Justin. Great, so now we'd like to invite people to ask a few questions. We'll run a few more polls towards the end here. One, let me just present the polls to people and get some of those questions in. So question we have, the uh, Jeff and Louis were interested in, what asset class uh, are you active in? Equities, FX, fixed income, commodities, options and futures or crypto? Obviously, it's a multiple choice question. Super, thank you. So a majority of people, 95% equities, followed by options options and futures, commodities, and then uh, fixed income and, and FX and crypto. Next poll asks about the use case you might have for point-in-time data, API, improving price, improving execution strategy, benchmarking uh, brokers, or simply understanding where you went wrong. So Louis and Jeff, coming back here, we have majority of people wanting to improve the execution strategy, followed by understanding where you went wrong, and then benchmarking brokers and improving price. So I'd like to encourage you to ask any questions. Someone asks, are you affiliated with Tick Data LLC? If so, what is the difference between one tick and tick data? Great question. Uh, one Market Data does own uh, Tick Data LLC. It's really a product platform within the suite of uh, one market data is a broad set of capabilities I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, the content from Tick Data is the same content that we have in One Tick Cloud. So we leverage the content. If you subscribe to Tick Data and want to access that in One Tick Cloud through the applications that we spoke about today or others, it's a very easy process to uh, essentially uh, continue using that license in our cloud platform. Um, in addition to the tick data content we have in one tick cloud, we have a broader set of global content as well uh, in one tick cloud. So tick data really becomes a subset of the overall inventory of data that we have in one tick cloud. Thank you, Jeff. Next question is, can we use uh, RIC or Figgy codes as a security ID? You can use Figgy codes, not RIC, um, because we can't support the translation from RIC to another identifier, but you can do that with uh, Bloomberg Figgy exchange symbols, QSIP, seed all license, and any other um, vendor symbology other than Rick. 
Here's a very good question. Can we use the point in time API intraday, i.e. for today's trading, or in other words, how soon afterwards can we access the API for today's executions? So the demo that we did today was for T plus one data. T plus one data typically is available several hours after the market closes, uh, certainly prior to the next open. We do have clients who run these same kinds of queries, the TCI API uh, queries that Louis has shown you against a real-time data. So we have that in our cloud as well. It's a different licensing model because you have to pay for the real-time exchange feeds or fees, I should say. Uh, whereas with the T plus one data, it's all kind of bundled together. But from a capability point of view, everything Louis showed uh, can be applied to real-time data as well as historical using the same, same queries. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, someone else asks, what pre-trade market impact models do you have implemented for equities? Answer that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, as part of this this um, sort of specialized data API, which is part of our cloud inventory, um, the that implies that you would be implementing a market impact model. Um, having said that, um, what I mean by that is we're providing the data that is the input to that impact model. Um, having said that, just overall, uh, within one tick in our end little analytical capabilities and data, we have the ability to implement market impact models. And I have done a, in the past a few specialized ones uh, for, for customers um, based on their own requirements. So we don't have any out of the box. Um, I know there are quite a few, sort of especially around the academic uh, papers, um, kind of universities that define and uh, pretty, some pretty nice models. Um, and most of what I see customers interested is implementing one or more of those models. So if your interest is um, market in pre-trade market impact models, that would require a more detailed conversation to understand how you want to do that. And, you know, overall that our technology can do that and we just don't have any out of the box. Okay, Louis, thank you so much. Uh, someone else asks, uh, Louis mentioned that you can make millions of queries each day. Do we have to split these into multiple batches? If so, what is the maximum size for each batch? The typical size is 10,000. Um, and even if you sent a file with 50,000 in it, we will cut that into 10,000 chunks. Uh, just for sort of, uh, you know, management of the overall process, that seems to be a reasonably optimal number. Um, on input, though, there is a lot of optimization when it comes to things related to data locality. If you remember when I talked about that input and each input, um, you can set uh, a COAC date or a corporate action date. If, in fact, you know, um, say you're going to request that same symbol um, a thousand times with a thousand different unique request date times, and if you know that this, the trade date is all the same, or even if it's a range of dates, uh, that that symbol is still active in that entire range. You can set a, sing, a single corporate action date. And that's an enormous optimization for that because if it is not, if you just simply set the COAG date to each request date and say there's a thousand different dates. There's a fair amount of overhead with that because now I have to validate that symbol on each of those thousand different dates. So I know that's kind of a long-winded answer, but the, again, what I'm sort of generally saying is, yeah, if you've got a million inputs, which we do have customers do, um, there is some sort of optimization that you can, you can do on your side to uh, make the process run a lot more efficient. Thank you, Louis. Next question is, do the interval benchmarks span multiple days? For example, if one wants to benchmark multi-day orders? Yes, absolutely. Fully supported. Nice. Does the point-in-time API have equities option options auction data? Um, it filters them out. Um, and one thing I did not show is but both Jeff and I referred to when it comes to all these different markets, there are um, trade conditions and market phases 
that the logic behind this point in time on a per market basis understands basically three main pieces, as you point out there. Um, when is it, uh, w what does a trade represent? Is it a, you know, a regular trade or any kind of an auction trade? Um, what phase the market's in? Is it continuous trading? Is it um, in some um, scheduled or unscheduled auction mode? Um, and lastly, what is the open hours? What defines, what is the timestamp of the open and the close on each market uniquely? Um, so all those things are part of the point in time for, again, for roughly a hundred different markets. Mm -hmm. The one uniqueness to that, or commonality, I should say, is because of MIFID, all those European markets, part of our uh, EU consolidation. And the reason we can create an EU consolidation is because of the market model topology required throughout Europe. So it's roughly 30, 35 different markets, all adhere to the same standard about trade reporting and quoting. Um, so it just makes understanding, you know, filtering conditions, market phases, um, pretty standard throughout Europe. Uh, but it is completely different in the US, Canada, Brazil, Singapore, Tokyo. It's completely different in all those markets. So the general uh, answer to your question is yes, the point in time API does understand um, market auctions, opens, close, regular trades, market phases. Next question, what sort of, if any debt loads will get throttling when hitting the API with OTC, have had some slow queries with OTQ. That's a knowledgeable question. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all yours, Jeff. <laughs> Hope you can answer that later. Yeah, I I I think the best way of answering that is who who's ever asking that maybe reach out to us specifically yeah. and let's see what you're doing. But in general, we're running this platform in AWS with scalable infrastructure, multiple instances to really optimize uh, performance and, and disk reads. So all those things are sort of part of the equation, I think, to uh, minimizing uh, query time. I think the other, you know, to add on to that, one of the reasons we created this for, um, for the point in time, the, the batch process is so you're not so um, subjected to any sort of performance um, variability with an on-domain API. So if you're in an on, using an on-domain API, it's a request and a response. So how long that take has got a thousand different variables associated with it. With the batch process now, it's disconnected. You upload a file um, and then we report back to you by virtue, you can check, you know, sort of status of how that thing is executing. And then you download results. So it's a much more, as the name implies, the batch name implies it's a disconnected operation. So anyway, next that's question. A comprehensive answer we should reach out later. Uh, next question comes, uh, do you fully normalize for corporate actions, <laughs> divisions, ticker change, yeah. your listing, it, et cetera? It is um, normalization for corporate actions applies only for the case of uh, the previous question, like with interval, if it's multi-day, um, because of that fact, what can happen? Nothing, there won't be any sort of corporate action intraday, but as soon as you span a day, whatever that day represents, I mean, it might have, you know, if it's going back to Friday, then you have a weekend or just Monday to Tuesday, what have you. Yeah, something can happen. Um, so yes, the, it does take into account that and that's what that coac date is all about you're telling me that symbol was active on that date um, if there was a, a split that took place then that would be accounted for or not right because of that coac date and the best way to dis to do that is actually through showing an e example um, so if you want to follow up and we can certainly talk about that example dividends are not included in this case delisted yeah um, if you get a delisted security, you can still query the history of that. Absolutely. Um, it's still it's still there in our T plus one data. Thank you. Next question. Is historic level two quote data available for US equities and US listed options? Yes, 
do we have U.S. equity and historical OPRA data? That's the question. No, the, answer. That, the question is about level two quote. Oh, okay. level two. I missed that. No, we do not currently provide uh, level two or level three data for any of the individual option markets or the U.S. equity markets. We do for uh, European markets and for some uh, Asian markets, but not presently for U.S. Okay, thank you. And next question is, can I do the interval benchmarks filtering special trades by trade conditions? By default, no, but that doesn't mean um, that this interface couldn't be extended to allow that. There's a lot of different extensions to this of all the different customers that we have using this point in time. I would say each one has some unique requirements that they have asked for that are part of this. So. Um, in terms of doing specialized trade filtering, absolutely we could do that. But the default is, is it's a predefined list of what's included and what isn't included. And for the most part, the intent was to do our best to match what Bloomberg has done. And to create that list uh, took about two years to, to sort of tune it and tweak it. Um, it's a non-trivial piece to do. And I think that's one of the sort of benefits to this point in time API is you get to leverage, um, uh, by using it, you get to leverage all the work we've done with uh, both ourselves and with other customers to create that trade filtering. And just to add to that, I think we spent a, a order amount of time on VWAP as well, the VWAP logic to match, um, you know, other vendors such as Bloomberg so that people can have consistent use of VWAP and trade condition filtering and currency filtering was and is a large part of uh, what's under the hood in terms of that VWAP calculation. One more question just came in. Do you have index data trade slash component MSCI or otherwise? No, we do not have constituent constituents of indices. We obviously have all the underlyings, but uh, we are not a redistributor of that information from any index sponsor, including MSCI. Thank you both for the preparation of the webinar. We'll reach out to people asking questions to follow up and see if there's any uh, additional information they'd like over email a bit later on. And as always, um, thank you to the presenters. And if you'd like to learn more about OneTick, please visit OneTick.com. Email us at info at OneTick.com. We have in future webinars on uh, many of the different products and solutions offered by OneTick. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Thank you.